Good evening, everybody, and uh, wow, what a pleasure it is to come back to you again and uh, share with you this evening. You know, I was approached by Pastor Daniel about, uh, you know, when we started to look into uh, really programming our broadcast, and we're always discussing what is uh, the next thing that we could do that will not only, because we're not only reaching City Life Church. City Life, you know we love you and we appreciate your faithfulness, but we're also here reaching out to the, the big old world, um, global world, aren't we? So uh, we have lots of people watching us from all over. And as I was really praying about you know, what we could share for this evening. This is what God really laid on my heart. You know, I'm a, I'm a missionary uh, at heart. And um, I, I chose the background because um, I just wanted to kind of put you in the mood. I've even uh, got my tea that I'm uh, drinking here. And um, I'm sat in, you know, a little tea shop here. And I just... Uh, wanted to share with you from my heart about, you know, just some testimonies, because sometimes I feel like that we do hear the word a lot and we need to hear the word. But I also think that with the word, we need to hear testimonies that will build our faith. And what the Lord really laid on my heart, I have never uh, done this again. This is completely uh, out of the ordinary for me. And, you know, it's just something that I really felt to do. But my parents, uh, mom uh, and dad, Franklin and Doris Burns, finally wrote a book after us kids insisting uh, for years that they really needed to put their stories down on paper. And so um, I've got that book here with me, Beyond uh, Possum Kingdom. And I just really felt led of the Lord to share directly from what mom and dad took lots of weeks and, and, you know, months to really put together. And so I've just chosen a few stories that I really want to build your faith today. Now, um, you'll forgive me if sometimes I do read and you'll forgive me if this is very informal as I just, uh, take my tea while I'm, uh, here in the tea shop. So let's talk about one of the things that they wrote about in the book. Now, one of the things I love about the way they did their book was they gave titles, of course, according to the testimony, but then, you know, they have a scripture to go with it. So, uh, first of all, God has a bigger plan. Acts 2, verse 11, and we all hear these people speaking in our own languages about the wonderful things God has done. Now, I'm going to read this a little bit, and what some of the parts that I, I actually remember, I might deviate from the book, but I just want to take you to the country of Colombia in South America, which is where I grew up. And um, we were uh, there building churches, and my dad's a church planter. And so from the time I was six years old, we went to Colombia, South America, and that's where I was raised. And so um, one of the things that would happen is teams would come over from America, and they would be there to go out and go door-to-door -door witnessing and uh, share the gospel. Now you say, how would they do that if they didn't speak the language? Well, the key was that there were those of us that went with them, so it would be two or three of them, then, you know, say I would go, or uh, someone else who spoke the language, uh, would have to be bilingual, of course, would go along and share the, the, the testimonies and, and the gospel with them. So this was back in the early 70s. I know it's a bit far back, but hey, it's still a, a testimony. It's still a, a story. And, and a lot of the times we do need to go back in history and read some stories to remind us of what God can do. So we were in a small uh, fishing village, which was along the Magdalena River in, in Colombia, and we were about to pioneer a new church. And um, we're reaching out where, you know, we've had signs and wonders already happening for a good while. And they were struggling, we, we were struggling to find a, a location about where we were going to 
uh, put the church. Now, first of all, there was a family there by the name of Sapata who had lived there all their lives. And um, they wanted to contribute to our ministry there as missionaries, and they wanted to help us with our plans. So they donated a piece of property. Now, I I could stop right there and say, wow, they donated a a prime piece of property right on the main highway where we could run a crusade and build a church completely free of charge. So uh, as you can see, and my dad even wrote, this is an outstanding miracle in itself, And such a precious commodity that a family would actually be willing to give us uh, their book. uh, I'm sorry, their book, their uh, land for us to build a church on. So we began working the land, which was our normal thing to clear it off and begin to get it ready for the church. Then the mayor of the town uh, showed up, had a pickup truck, which was, you know, just a truck with a bed on the back full of vegetables, fruit and other food which he brought brought along to feed us and those who were working alongside us. So we began to really witness an expression of people's love in the towns where we were working and we could see that they were really wanting and expecting uh, a move of God to happen. Now, during this time, this is when we got contacted by a group of young people from America. Most of them were teenagers, so, you know, uh, 16, 17, 18 years old. They wanted to come out to Colombia, and they wanted to do a missions trip, and, and they wanted to do personal evangelism. So they had heard about our ministry and they wanted to come and work with us. So, of course, we never turned down help. And uh, so we said yes. And the young people arrived and they were very excited, really on fire for God and eager uh, to serve. And often uh, we would find that. Now, here we are. We're in this remote uh, fishing village where, um, you know, the the locals had never, ever. I, I just want you to have a picture of this. They've never seen Americans before. And they're not familiar with the English language at all. So um, on top of that, just think about that the young people who came also did not speak any Spanish. And so uh, that's why we formed the two or three, pairing them up with Colombians who would then be their interpreter. Now, how this would work is groups of young people would go out, they would take a street and began to do door-to-door evangelism, knocking on the doors, and, um, you know, then the um, English kids would begin to speak through the Spanish uh, interpreter that was with them, and uh, they would begin to then share the gospel. Now, there was a unique situation that happened. So, one of the young ladies, her name's Donna, okay, and she's 17, And on one of the days when everyone had gone out to go door to door, Donna did not have anyone to go with her. And, you know, she wanted to go up and down the streets uh, of the village and, and she wanted to do door to door witnessing, but she couldn't do it because she didn't speak the language. And, of course, she was very upset because she had flown all the way to Columbia to do this and uh, she didn't want to just sit, um, you know, on uh, at the church and do nothing. So she went to my dad and began to really beg him to please let her go uh, down uh, one of the roads and, and start to invite people to come to the crusade. Now, what she really was hoping to do was to tell people about Jesus. Now, um, I assured her, my dad, in other words, assured her that there was no way he was going to let her go off on her own. Remember, we're in a remote village. She doesn't speak the language. They don't speak the language. We can't possibly be allowing her to go off at 17, especially when we were responsible for her. So uh, my dad kept insisting, no, I'm sorry, I cannot do that. And finally, she said, Franklin, obviously my dad's name, please, can I just go down this one road? I promise I won't leave this road. I will stay right here. I'm just going to knock on the doors on this road. And uh, I promise I'll come back after that. And then, you know, my dad said to her, but Donna, I I understand, you know, okay, you have found a street that you want to go up, but you don't even speak Spanish. 
and no one is going to understand you. We're in a remote village. No one's even heard English before. So I really can't let you go without a chaperone. Well, she wouldn't listen, and I don't know, some way, somehow, uh, she said, if you will just let me go, I know God is going to speak through me. So um, finally, um, he said, I kept on saying no and kept on saying no till I realized she was not going to give up. So I finally just had to agree to let her go. And so um, she finally, and he said, my, uh, my dad said, the final thing I do want to tell you is I don't want you going inside any of the houses. Um, and even if they invite you in, do not go in because I want to be able to walk up the road and just look down the road and see where you are. So uh, she said, okay, I promise I, I won't go inside any house. So my dad let her go and um, he had made up his mind. He was going to make sure he was persistently checking on her to make sure she was okay. But first, he, you know, wanted to check on the other teams, and then he agreed that he would come back and, and uh, check on her. So he drove up and down the roads in our truck and just checking on the teams that were knocking on different doors. And then suddenly he realized, it's time for me to go and check to see what Donna's up to. So um, he arrived back at the road where he had left her and where she had promised to stay, and there was no sign of her. So he drove up and down the road several times, nowhere to be seen. Finally, he jumped out of the truck. My dad's going from house to house. Uh, he looked for some of the local kids that knew us on the street saying, hey, have you seen this woman, this girl? She's out, you know, knocking doors. And usually, you know, kids would follow uh, people around anyway all the time. But there was no kid, no kids around uh, to really uh, the amount, a great amount of them to talk to, and there was no Donna. By this time, very frustrated, you can imagine, and my dad was very concerned, and he was all, he was almost like upset with himself because he thought, I knew it, I, I shouldn't have let her do this. And he was looking everywhere when all of a sudden he went around a corner. And technically, yeah, she was still on the road, but she had gone down one of the little side streets off of the road that she was on. Now, when he got there, he could see that she was busy talking to a group of eight fishermen. Now, I want you to picture this in your mind. There's eight fishermen, hardworking guys, weren't wearing shirts, very tanned by the sun. They've got their nets still hanging over their shoulders. And they're on their way to the river, which is just down the road. And as he approached, as my dad approached to the group, he could hear Donna telling this story and telling them how Jesus died on the cross for their sins and that he rose again and ascended into heaven and that he loved them. And as my dad listened to the message of salvation and just with such love that she was expressing this because he said it was so passionate. And he said, you know, it's just so sad because it's, you know, the how are they uh, even going to know what she's saying? Because, um, you know, they, uh, they can't understand her. And um, then uh, he decided... You know what? I think she's going to need my help. Uh, I think I need to step in and I'm going to interpret for her. But just as my dad was about to step in and interpret for her, Donna says to the group of men, please throw off your nets, kneel down, and raise your hands towards heaven and just ask Jesus to come into your heart forgive you of their sins, and he will cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Just tell Jesus how much you love him, and he loves you. And my dad said, right there before my eyes, I watched eight fishermen who never had heard a word of English in their lives simultaneously take their nets off, fall to their knees, and raise their hands in prayer. Now, 
listen, they had never been exposed to the gospel. They didn't know anything about prayer. They had never heard about the calling of God, but they all knelt down and looked to the heavens and called upon the name of Jesus Christ in their own language, asking him to save them and forgive them. Suddenly, Donna turns around and sees my dad standing there and says, Oh, Franklin, I need your help. I need your help. And my dad said, Donna, you don't need any help from me. God has already intervened and given you all the help you need. Now listen, this is an incredible miracle. Speaking the heart that Donna had shared from her heart, that Donna had shared the good news in her language, and the fishermen had heard it in theirs, I was reminded straight away of the scene in Acts 2 when the Holy Spirit fell and people heard the message of the gospel in their native tongue. Remember, I started off by reading the scripture and we all hear these people speaking in our own languages about the wonderful things God has done. Once again, my dad was amazed about how God will work miraculously to fulfill his word and touch the lives of those who are lost. And we continued to evangelize those streets for several weeks and we ended up building a church filled with people. Now listen, from this, this passage and from this story, I just want you to know something. If you're someone right now who doesn't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, this is all you have to do. You just have to ask Jesus to come into your heart to forgive you of your sins and he will cleanse you and forgive you and he will give you new life just like these eight fishermen did with Donna. Listen, if that doesn't tell you that there is a God, I don't know what will. Because when I think about the fact that, did they hear it in their language? Did she speak in Spanish? Who knows and who cares? What we know is that God is an amazing God and he can do things in his own creative way. And I hope, if nothing else, God will show you and how to build up your faith. Never, ever be afraid that when you are sharing the gospel and talking to someone about Jesus, never, ever wonder if they understand or they're listening to you because God will make a way, especially when you've got that passion in your heart and you really want to share uh, with them. He will make a way for you to be able to do that. Now, I just want to take a couple of more minutes and I want to share one other one with you that's one of my favorites of my dad's and it's how far can you travel on $12, which is probably somewhere between 10, uh, 9 and 10 pounds. Now, this is going way back, but I want you to know that this one, the reason I chose is because if you're today listening and you're thinking, I don't have much money, I don't know what I'm going to do, I need God to intervene and make a way. Well, I'm about to tell you a story of how God can make a way in the most unbelievable circumstances. So, um, my dad had just finished preaching a two-week revival. Now, he is in Texas, and this is before he went to the mission field. It was the second time that he had been to this town to conduct uh, a crusade, or in other words, a meeting where they would go every night, usually open air or in a tent. On the last night, they decided to leave my mom and dad and travel to my dad's mom's home in another part of Texas, which was only a few hours away. As they were driving along with my mother and me, so I was two months old, so here I am telling this story uh, 50 something years later when I was two months, and God uh, uh, miraculously showed up uh, to my dad. And um, he said, it never surprises me anymore that God chooses to speak to us, but he frequently surprises me with what he has to say and how he chooses to do it. So my dad tells the story that it was the early hours, the wee hours of the morning, when he heard the voice of God loud, clear, and awesome. 
There was no doubt in my mind that God had spoken to me and given me direction for the next assignment that we were going to do. And this is when God said, leave Texas, go to the state of Tennessee and preach revival. Now, currently, he was in West Texas, which is way out towards New Mexico, Arizona, California way. And um, it's a very long way. Trust me, uh, if you look up the roads and the the area in Texas and you drive, you could drive for hours and not even leave the state of Texas. And um, my dad said, I've learned not to question the Lord. So I just accepted it. And his presence was so powerful, I knew God had spoken to me. So he reaches over and he shakes my mom and he wakes her up. And he says, honey, the Lord just spoke to me and said, we're, we're to go to Tennessee and preach revival. Her reaction expressed the words that I had already been thinking. In other words, my dad had already been thinking. She said, uh, we don't know anyone in Tennessee. Well, it was true. I knew no one. I had never been invited to preach anywhere in that state and no church, no crusade. We had never even been there. So, of course, we didn't know anyone. But we arrived at my mom's house uh, early on hours of the morning. My mom had been, uh, his mom had been a pastor's wife and had helped his dad pioneer a dozen churches. And she understood when my dad expressed to her after he arrived hey, we're going to Tennessee because God told me this is the next place for us to go. Well, there were a few obstacles in the way. He had $2 left after they had finished paying all the bills for the crusade that they had just completed. Now, that's about probably a pound, I don't know, 25, something like that. He assured his mother that somehow we would get to Tennessee, uh, whether only he only had $2 or not. Now, thank God for godly mothers. And I want to say I'm one of those mothers that pray incessantly for my daughter and my kids and, uh, you know, sons and daughters. We pray for them every day, Paul and I do. And um, I know there's lots of you godly mothers and grandmothers who are doing the same. So his mom did not try to discourage him or tell him that it was nonsense. She just said, if you've heard from God, you've got to go. So he said, I'm stepping out. I know the Lord will provide. They spent the next day preparing for their long trip and planned to leave the day after that. At this point, he said, I guess I did a foolish thing in order to raise a tiny amount of cash. I took our car's spare tire And I went to the local uh, petrol station and I sold it for $5, which again, £3.50, £3.75. Now I've got $7. So here he goes and um, he loads up the car and then an elderly neighbor came over and she starts talking to him. And um, she says, you know, I'm on a fixed income, but... God has told me to come and give you $5. So he expressed his thanks to him, gratefully received the money. Now he's got $12, which is obviously roughly about 10 pounds. The question is, how far can you go on $12? And ask yourself, traveling in England, how far can you go on 10 pounds? However much you have, you can travel a long, long way when you know God is involved and when he tells you to do it. So the next morning, they packed and they went on. They traveled for two days, finally pulled over at the side of the road. They slept in their car, or we slept in the car, because I was with them at two months old. No money for a hotel. Uh, Mom and Dad didn't buy any food for themselves. They only purchased enough milk for me. So, of course, yes, I got fed. And they had petrol for the car. They finally arrived in Tennessee. And dad said, I don't know why, but I just said, Holy Spirit, I'm asking you to lead me. And he said, I realized then I knew how Abraham must have felt when you read in the Bible, when it says he was traveling off to the the town of Ur, when God said, just go. So they drove for the remainder of that day and they ended up in a town that would take them right close to the state of Kentucky. And he said, 
you know, if we leave any further, we're going to be leaving the state of Tennessee. Well, we couldn't go any further anyway because the gas, the petrol tank was on empty. Baby had no milk. God said, go to Tennessee. Here we are. And we sat there for a moment. And then he said, suddenly I looked up and I saw a church, which was an assembly of God church. I decided to go over there and see if anyone was there. I knocked on the door. A lady opened it. She told me she was the secretary, which I found unusual because back then lots of churches didn't have a secretary who ran the office. They didn't have the money. He explained to them that he was missionary evangelist and that they had traveled clear across Texas and Arkansas just to get to Tennessee. And she, he said, I wonder if it might be possible for me to speak to the pastor. So she gave him the directions on how to get there. And then she said, if you go there, um, there will be, uh, there's a conference going on. All of the pastors will be there. Just go in there to the meeting and eventually you'll get to talk to the pastor. Well, they made a quick detour. They stopped in the petrol station. They went to the toilets. They cleaned themselves up a bit. And he said, just like Superman, you know, changes his clothes in a phone booth. Here we are as an evangelist changing our clothes. We got ourselves ready. And here we go. And he said, this is where the story really gets interesting. We drove down the road. We found the church. And it was just as the secretary had said. A meeting was in progress. A pastor was preaching from the pulpit. And it was later that he found out he was the pastor of the church. They found a place to sit down and they were listening to the message. And at that point, one of the other men that was sitting on the platform jumped to his feet and approached the preacher. He said, Pastor, excuse me for interrupting you, but I have an announcement to make and I need to make it right now. So a bit bemused and surprised, like what's this all about? The preacher stood aside and said, okay, go ahead. And the man then said, as the pastor of this church, I want to announce we are going to start a revival this Sunday. Now, a revival, for those of you that may not know, is a week long meetings that would go every single night. And we are going to start this revival this Sunday, and we're going to start it with the couple who just walked through the door. I don't even know who they are. But when they came in and walked through the door, hallelujah, God said to me, you are to start a revival with them this Sunday. With that, he apologized and said to the speaker, I'm really sorry, but I just felt that I had to say that right then and there. And he sat down. And then he said, I just, my dad said, I just sort of waved at the guy and said, okay, thank you very much. And then that afternoon when the service finished, He took us back to his home. He arranged a room for us. We started the meetings and they continued for two weeks every night. They were absolutely wonderful meetings. During that time, pastors started to come from around the area. And as they did, they began to invite us to come and minister at their churches. All in all, we went from church to church in the whole part of Tennessee, and we stayed there for five months preaching, never lacking a church to preach in. God did great things through the revival meetings every night for five months. Souls were saved, lots of miraculous healings, and it impacted so many lives that even the superintendent of the whole organization of the state of Tennessee dedicated our baby YNL, that's me, and which was, I was their first child, I am their first child, and he dedicated me in one of those meetings. After that, they felt led to go to Louisiana and from there back to Texas, where they continued to hold revivals. God is awesome, and this is what my dad wrote. If we are obedient to go where and when he tells us, then he will meet all of our needs. Even when the circumstances look rough, Even when it seems impossible, with God, everything is possible. That's what happens when you follow the voice of God and when you allow him to speak to you and you're willing to listen to what he has to say and be obedient 
you will bear much fruit. Now, I've only covered a couple of testimonies out of this book. And of course, if you'd like to have a copy, I think it's still available on Kindle. I, I have the actual book, obviously, that my parents signed and gave to me. But I just want to say to you tonight, listen, God loves you. He knows where you are. He knows what you're going through. He knows what you need. All you need to do is you must trust him. And you need to know that no matter what or how much you have, you need to know that he will cover what you need and he will make it happen. And you also need to know that when you're in those diverse circumstances, he can make a way where there is no way and he can use you to witness and reach out to others. And I want to pray for you. Whatever you're going through, whatever your need is, whatever you're feeling right now, there is an answer. And God is that answer. And he loves you abundantly. Father, we thank you, Lord God, because we know, Lord, that you love us and you love us so much. You can't love us anymore. And Lord, I pray for those that right now do not know you as their Lord and Savior. I pray, Lord, that they will fall down on their knees and they will raise their hands and ask you to come into their hearts and forgive them of their sins. And Lord, that you will make them whole and brand new again. And Father, I also ask that those who have needs, financial needs, physical needs, Lord, they may feel like there's no hope. They've lost their joy. Lord, I pray right now that you will touch their lives let them feel your presence right where they are. And I pray, Lord God, that we will hear testimonies of people who write in about their salvation, about their healings, and how you have provided. And Father, we thank you, Lord God, that we know that you are the almighty God who provides everything that we need, and you still speak today. And we thank you for speaking to us, and we give you praise for that. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. May God richly bless you. I pray that if you did pray that prayer, please write that uh, email on the screen or text us or get on there on the chat team. We have host people waiting to contact and, and interact with you. But let us know how God has spoken to you, how God has changed you, and what we can do for you. Don't lose hope. God loves you. He knows where you are and he will provide. Amen and God bless you.